Wilder, welcome to Apollos Water. Great to be with you, Travis. Are you ready for the Fast Five? Well, never ready for anything too fast. Okay, okay here we go. I know you live in the Rockies, but I also oh, yeah. you grew up in the Andes. So, right. the Andes or the Rockies? Uh, the Andes are taller. But is that why? Is that why you like them because they're taller? Well, yeah, there's more diversity there. I mean, you get all the way from dry deserts, the driest on the world, to uh, snowy mountains to uh, jungles. You know, it's got it all mixed in there. But in terms of just a lovely place to live, I'm glad I picked the Rockies. Did you ever think that, hey, I why I picked the Rockies is because I grew up in the Andes? Oh, yeah, there's no no doubt about it at all. I, mean, I was <laughs> for a while living in sort of flatter land, and I thought, I got to find someplace where there's mountains. So that's why I wanted to go to the Rockies, and here I am. There you go. And so you've also spent a lot of time doing cross-cultural work. I mean, it, it's pretty clear in your books. But what is the funniest cross-cultural experience you've ever had? Well, I think it was the time I was in Sri Lanka, and I'd been there for a while. Hadn't seen a vegetable in a great long time. So they came out with this plate that I thought was green beans. And so I just got, grabbed some of those green beans and just, you know, started eating them. First bite, I realized these are the hot uh, peppers locally. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm in front of this big, <laughs> this big group. You know, I'm not either going to spit this out because I got a mouthful <laughs> of the hottest peppers that they got there. Or I'm going to swallow it whole, and I decided to swallow it whole. <laughs> for, the, for the next day and a half, I traced my digestive tract. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is really good. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I, oh, that's really good. Okay, here's the third question. Let's do a little desert island, all right? So if you were stranded on a desert island with one book outside of the Bible that you have to have for the rest of your life, what would it be and why? Well, um, if you can take the trilogy of Lord of the Rings and make one book out of it, I think that's the one I would I would read. I mean, there's always something in there. No one's ever figured out what he's talking about on, on many different levels. And, you know, just be fascinated. Uh, you know, that whole different world that he that Tolkien creates would uh, I think that would be the book I would be working on. Wow, that's that is a challenge, though. And I think you're right. I don't know how many people really know what mm -hmm. he was talking about. All right, here we go. Number four, because you travel so much. Here's a question for you. If you were an airline, what would be your catchphrase and why? Um, we'll bring you back down. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, you know, you put put you in a big tin can and throw you across the sky real fast. You know, that's the one thing I want to know that they'll bring me back down. Bring you back down. Oh, so no, I don't. I mean, it, you might get a lot of customers that way. I don't know, but that's that's a funny one. All right, here's the last question: If you were a store, what store would you be, and why? Oh, uh, now you're really getting out of my area. You know, um, shopping is not my specialty, so. Um, I think I'd be a um, bakery because I've never been to a bakery and, and, and found some, couldn't find something I liked, you know, I thought taking a tour of the world's bakeries and waterfalls would be a really nice kind of trip. So I'll be a bakery. I'm sure there's probably some Facebook group about that. I'm sure there is a waterfalls and bakeries that uh, somebody's going to write a book based on that. So oh, let's get to your story. I mean, you've written a lot, you've helped a lot of people, but how, I'm not sure how many people really know who you are, like the Jim Wilder story. What is the, the Jim Wilder story? Well, um, I guess the, the thing about it is I was curious and I've always been curious about uh, how the mind and body work. Uh, I think possibly partly because I had a stroke when I was two years old, which is sort of unusual. Mm. But it was one of these really nasty tropical viruses that made me you know, blow out a blood vessel. And, and so this whole, whole curiosity of how things work and also just added to that, that Jesus ended up with a physical body, which he's going to use for all eternity. Uh, and so, you know, these things are meant to combine in some way. And, uh, you know, how does that work together? Because, you know, 
from as early as I remember, there's this fight going on between science and Christianity, you know, more or less. And, you know, it's something that should have harmonized. And so my curiosity of how things work, you know, from taking apart everything I could as a kid, you know, and trying to put it back together, um, to looking at plants and animals and ecosystems and humans and cultures and traveling from one culture to another, realizing, you know, the Christians in one culture look uh, so different from the Christians in another culture, but they look more like their own culture than they do Christians elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Like, how do people work? This is a very strange thing. So that fascination keeps me going because every day I wake up curious about something. You also, though, grew up in a cross-cultural environment. I mean, or were you, were you born in the Andes or did you yeah. go there? Mm -hmm. as a Spanish so was my first team. language, yeah. Mm -hmm. and wow. We were raised in a small little village up in the Andes. First telephone I think we got when we were, fif when we were 15. I was 15. And so uh, television wasn't around and, you know, we rode horses and stuff like that. So it's almost like growing up in a different century, really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, among indigenous peoples, uh, groups, and seeing quite a variety of different cultures. Yeah, it was a very fascinating place to grow up. And, and on the other side, they were having a civil war where about a quarter of a million people were killed, sort of Rwandan style. And so mm -hmm. you got to see some of the, you know, ugly side of human nature as well. So very diverse. Well, you mentioned that in the book, too. You, you talk about that in Rare Leadership. And um, I'm curious, though, how did you go from being in the Andes with this other century where there's there's strife, there's violence, you're on horses, you don't have a telephone to brain science? I mean, you go from kind of one extreme to the other. What led to that journey? Um, part of it's a little hard to guess, but I, just my fascination with science, the, the thing I wanted most as a boy was a microscope you know, because there's all these things swimming in the water you can't see and you don't want to drink. Uh, and <laughs> just kind of this curiosity of what's going on inside. And uh, I originally wanted to be a medical doctor. And then I happened to witness somebody being healed in response to prayer from a psychological trauma. And I thought, ooh, how does that work? And so I uh, my interest moved over to psychology to try and see how the mind worked um, because that that was a whole new mechanism I'd never witnessed before and um, it made me very fascinated then with how do we get to become the people God wants us to be which you know from my own personal struggle you know I tried following all the rules and doing it right and you know never seemed to work for me at all so I figured uh, whatever the secret was to the church working the way we saw in the new testament i hadn't come across it yet and these you know these streams sort of mixed together uh but all through school the brain was the least of my interests so it was like yeah i don't want to study that's too technical but i kept getting assigned to these brain labs and uh, you know va hospital doing neurological assessment and and it was like well i'll never use this stuff <laughs> uh until you know the day that god sort of put it all together and it was like whoa i had no idea i was getting prepared to do this mm. how old were you when you came to the united states uh 17 so you jumped right from one culture right into the next i mean that's that's pretty extreme was that a massive cultural adjustment for you oh uh, yes it was um for one thing i ended up in a very uh conservative christian school in the south mm. um and moving from a community where I knew everybody to a school where it was mostly about following rules and stuff like that, that I didn't make any sense to me. And then the next year I went to a public school where, you know, they had rock and roll bands and all that sort of thing. And, the, you know, this, this country seemed to be really peculiar to me. I'm sure. How, and you said you were 17. So what year are we talking about? About. Uh, 67, 1967, which is already in a huge tumultuous move, cultural, a cultural shift that so would we'll be able to walk into mm -hmm. that and then to, to, to shape all, all that. Yeah, and then Vietnam you, war and all that stuff going on. Yeah. So then that you're, you're going into studies, you're, you're being shaped into this uh, brain science, but what was the, what was the impetus? And maybe it's, it's several different 
incremental steps that really led from you, you're walking with God and then you started to go, okay, how does brain science or how does the brain affect this? What, what really set that off? I mean, you've given a bit of a hint of it, but what, what else was there? Well, at one point um, we were seeing uh, about 1,200 trauma victims a month in this counseling center that I worked at. Mm -hmm. And we realized that, you know, the trauma had somehow, somehow impacted them. And the ones that were recovering or sustaining their recovering uh, in some way were part of church groups that sort of end, acted like an extended family and they were recovering. The ones that were just getting therapy were not sustaining their recovery very well. And we wanted to know what the difference was and why some people seem to not make any, any recovery at all. And it was mm -hmm. at that point uh, that we started trying to develop a, a model of how life worked that we called the life model and uh, trying to keep it uh, sort of not cross-cultural, but we wanted to, something that could be made sense of for non-Western cultures as much as for Western cultures. So the best of, of Western science and the best of um, more relational cultures. And it was at that point when we had sort of lined up, what does the Bible say about um, how people develop that we encountered the brain science. It says at all the stages, like between child and infant and parent and adult, um, those stages, there was a significant change in the brain that required us learning something about being human and the people that weren't recovering had no one to teach them how to be human they mm. had people to teach them theology but no one to show them how to be human and so all of a sudden how the brain developed became very very important to us and i was working with dallas willard's wife jean willard and so mm -hmm. dallas was a consultant so he's working on the spiritual formation side and we're working on the emotional development side and realizing, you know, there's some element from each that has to be incorporated if you're going to end up maturing and starting to look and act like Jesus. And so that's where the, the fascination with, well, we got to really figure this out showed up. I, I want to park on something that you mentioned and go back to something just for a second. You, you mentioned that people that were struggling had people to teach them theology, but not how to be human. Explain that for a bit, because I think that's very, very true. We have a lot of theology, but not a lot of humanity. Mm -hmm. Explain that if you would, well, if you don't mind. If you have noticed with children when they're born, they don't have a very good idea of how to be human and how to interact with other people, how to use language, how to control their own bodies, you know, how to get along in groups, all those sorts of things. And the brain actually has to learn this sort of from scratch, you might say. It's pretty disorganized going in. And the way the brain does it is by attaching to somebody and then say, I'm going to copy them. And so if they speak English, we learn English. If they speak Spanish, we learn Spanish. If they speak, you know, Hausa, they learn Hausa and they learn the habits and customs and everything. So basically they're learning how to be human. But the most important thing is learning to understand how a mind that's older, bigger, and wiser than mine thinks, so that I can become like that mind. That's basically what the brain is designed to do. Find a bigger, better, smarter model with more experience that can show me how do I live now, and that's what we model after. Now, suppose your parents have severe um, psychological disorders. Uh, they were raised under, uh, you know, severe trauma, so some of the people we had uh, had been in the Holocaust. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the people were, their parents were criminally insane and, and locked up in, in the state uh, prisons for the criminally insane. And so they had copied some pretty disturbed experiences and minds of whatever was going on. So when we want to understand how does God think when he loves me, he's taking care of me. If everybody that I know of has abused me, your brain says, I don't understand this language. I can't, can't track it. And, you know, simply becoming Christian doesn't do that, you know, any better than it does with our other language. For instance, I've yet to meet anyone who, because they became Christian, 
were suddenly fluent in Hebrew and Greek and could read the original texts. Mm -hmm. You know, they had to learn that. So to learn the relational language that helps us get along with other people and understand what they're thinking, we also have to have experiences with mm, relatively honest and uh, available minds. And so that's what people were gaining from these church families uh, was that kind of practice. But at the time, we couldn't tell you what the elements were. Uh, and the brain science said specifically, here are the things that your brain must be able to do if you want to understand other minds. And so we've been pra practicing teaching the people that don't have those skills uh, how to do them or how to, you know, learn from somebody who does have the skills and then spread that to other people in the interests of helping them understand God and his mind. Do you find, I mean, when you were doing that initially, did were those churches that you were interacting with, were those different ethnic churches or were those just normal churches in that area that had already a, a better focus on these issues? Um, no, actually, what we found out was that none of the people who are participating with church were part of a program that the church had initiated. It turns out it was a spontaneously merging from a small group or an encounter uh, of people that decided they wanted to do a little bit more of life together and support each other. Um, you know, so these are spontaneous gatherings that sort of formed out of churches, never out of a, a, uh, an intentional program by the church. Not that churches weren't running lots of intentional programs, but they weren't doing the thing we needed. Uh, mm. It was people who kind of looked at somebody and go, hey, you need a family. You need somebody to be with on Thanksgiving. You need someplace to go camping on the weekend. Come along with us. Um, you know, and they were just basically sharing life together with other people uh, and from a lot of different churches. But um, uh, and so it was diverse, but not by intention. In, in looking at that, my mind is just going to so many different things like net right now of what you're what you're talking about and hearing this and all the different experiences that people have because what I, I have seen people do do a lot of churches do programs well they do management well you know the whole trellis in the vine the trellis is great but there there is not and I don't want to say there's not an awareness there's a greater awareness now on the the self in a good way I mean of course you've got people talking about God centered and Jesus centered and we we all want to be that but at Apollos Water, one of the things we talk about is we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it, is to love our neighbor as ourself. And that's the part that I think people miss is that because the culture has become so self-absorbed that they they don't have a, a proper balance. I mean, we know that the devil takes one thing and goes to an extreme and and we, but we do have to have a proper understanding of the self and, and the relational aspect of things in a body, because I, I think, and I, I, I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but a lot of times when people do choose churches, it's not always because of the theology, although that should be it, but it's about the community, about the identity, about feeling a part of that group. As you've done this research and you're helping people see that, I mean, wh why the greater focus on this now? I, I mean, why have we had to come to a point where we need to understand this relational aspect that we've lost? Because being in church history, looking over uh, time, I don't know how much those in the second, third century were talking in this same way. And, and one of the things that I've struggled with is saying, okay, we have this language now, we're, we're able to kind of parse our experience, our feelings, our emotions, not to say that they didn't thin, but they didn't have the much language and it was more of a survival uh, in a lot of ways. And a lot of those things were much more intuitive within the culture. What has happened that has brought this desire to understand the self and our relationships? And, and, and if I'm saying something incorrect, please feel free to correct me, uh, that we need to talk about this now. Yeah, so the changes in our culture are going on at a rate they haven't before, and we have um, at least uh, two major changes that I can point to. One is the uh, Industrial Revolution, just and thinking that. when that hit, uh, we no longer spent most of the time with our family uh, in multi-generational context. We are now pretty much in, uh, in work groups for large parts of the day. 
So whereas previously, if I was, let's say, a stonemason, mm -hmm. I would have spent most of my time with my family and we're going to work together. And we would have, uh, you know, I've, my grandfather was probably there. He'd probably been damaged by some accident at work. So he helped raise me when I was little. And then I went worked with my dad, who is, you know, whatever it is. And my children would even be expected to follow those kind of things that just made a multi-generational life make sense. And we didn't move anywhere very often. So most of the people who I know, and that's one of the things of growing up in South America, most of the people there could tell you uh, what the grandparents of any per particular person in the village had been like. So if your grandfather had been a wonderful person, you know, your family was esteemed in the, in the town. Mm -hmm. And if your grandfather had been a jerk, your family was looked at with some suspicion. That's the downside of it. But here we have the long-term effects of being human, very obvious from at least three or four generations. Like, you know, whatever I'm doing is going to impact my great, my grandchildren, at least probably my great grandchildren. And that's completely disappeared from, from culture. Then the second thing is that uh, it takes practice to relate to other people. And currently, most people are spending about eight hours a day looking at a computer screen. Uh, computer screens are not people. They don't interact. They don't track us the same way that other people will. The consequences of our, our behaviors don't, you know, they're not too obvious. And so uh, we've, you know, you can be very rude with a computer screen. Uh, and you don't, you know, if you walk away feeling like a hero, you can't do that in a village where your gra grandchildren are going to re remember that you were a jerk, you know. Mm. So these kind of things that formed us into humans and helped us understand how our cultures and communities work, and even the practice time we need to interact with other people uh, has rapidly fallen apart. Um, and then there's been the other philosophical changes and stuff like that. Um, a lot of moving that didn't happen before. So uh, when you move someplace, you kind of leave your past behind you. Uh, and um, uh, so the sense that, you know, we make a difference long term in the world is mostly disappeared from human uh, interactions. And now we just, it's a question of how well we do our job, uh, becoming mm. sort of the, the mainstay of identity and but I think at the in the West, both both men and women are, you know, being reduced to how well they perform whatever their job function is. Uh, there's really quite a bit of difference from a mm -hmm. relational world that uh, uh, where we all learn these things. So now we have to teach people what you know your grandfather couldn't teach you because you've never seen him or you only you know vacationed with him twice when you went back to visit you know for a week. Take, taking that then into consideration, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a rediscover of our humanity as we become much more individualistic, we become more separated, we become more technological and isolated. You're calling it, and, and it seems that you're calling people back to a lot of the practices that the ancient, I don't want to say the ancient world, majority world cultures have managed to hold on to that have been taken for granted, but the Bible already talks about, and you're just giving the brain science behind why this occurs the way that it does. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's we're basically saying, here's the mechanism. And you know, the, the worse you are at it, the, the better it is to know the way the brain works. If, you're, if your culture is all very good at, so let's say, treating people with respect, um, you'll have learned a, a you know, hundred, a thousand ways to show respect for other people. Um, if you've been raised watching sitcoms where people are rude to each other and that's how you get the most laughs and, you know, social media where, you know, uh, a smart comment is gets more likes than, you know, than other things. Those kind of responses mean we need a lot of practice and it'd be better to learn it the way the brain learns it. Uh, so the more efe efficient we become, because we've got now a small window to put it in, the more efficient we become, the more important that that detail becomes as part of our life. And as far as the world's concerned, I was speaking to the Christian universities of Asia. They were lamenting the fact that 
most of their students, uh, even two decades ago, came knowing who their people were and what their identities were. Now most of these young people have created their own community online with people their parents and community have no idea they're interacting with. And they're coming in quite confused about who are my people and what are we like and what do we do and what do we value. Uh, the Korean youth in high school now are beginning to show signs that we would consider Alzheimer's, uh, early signs of dementia from simply uh, excessive screen exposure. So, you know, cultures that, uh, you know, 20 years ago were very um, well established are disintegrating before our lives, our eyes around the world. Uh, so the, the spread, the rapid spread of, of technology is just having massive impact. And so how are we going to put back in to people's minds? Here's how you understand uh, your people to be the people of God. And how do you um, teach other people how to look and act like Jesus? And one more comment I'll throw in is that you know, when, when we pray or study the scripture, we have a, often have a spiritual revelation of a kind of life that we hadn't imagined. But your brain doesn't get good at it under duress unless you practice it with other people. So in other words, I can know that God loves me. But as soon as you cut me off in traffic, I forget that God loves me. Unless I've practiced it with other people, then, I, then that practice in my brain reminds me Oh, yeah, yeah, even when people cut you off, God loves you. So we want to be loving in this context. And so the, and, you know, we have to have the truth on the one side, but we have to have the practice with people on the other side if we're going to do it under duress. You mentioned someone cutting you off in traffic. My, my question is not, does God love me? It's, does God love them? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, now, if you're God's face in traffic, people will be looking at you to see the answer. That's true. That That's true. Talk about that for a minute. You mentioned that in the other half of church, you talk about seeing the necessity of the face. Um, and even in the, the uh, ironic blessing, you know, the Lord causes face to shine upon you. This idea the scripture talks about is the face. What is the, the significance both theologically and for us spiritually in understanding the face? Um, yeah, that's really, to me, very, very fascinating because babies develop their identity looking at faces before they can ever understand words. So by the time you have a, a vocabulary of 50 words, you've pretty much figured out how to interact with other human beings. You'll be about 18 months old. And so the brain is already designed to look at people's face and look, who are the eyes looking at me? Who's glad to be with me? Who shares my distress? And then I'll copy how they act. And all of that is registered on the face. Uh, it's the primary means of communication. And it happens uh, much faster than uh, spoken communication. So you and I might, you know, we're, we're giving very long paragraphs in between our mm -hmm. comments, right? But that would say we have one exchange that goes on every, um, you know, two or three minutes. But face-to-face -face communication runs back and forth six times per second. So I actually, since we're watching each other on video cameras, um, you know, the fact that you nodded right there, the audience can't see it, but uh, or smiled just now, all these things communicate <laughs> to me much faster than any words ever would. Uh, what's going on in your mind? And that's how we, we learn to be human and understand each other it's through the face. You talk about the face, you talk about the, the life model works, you talk about rare leadership. I mean, these are all, I, I find this particularly fascinating because as you said, or as we discussed in the pre-show walkthrough, you've given words to stuff and experiences that many people have felt were missing in their, their world. Why is it then imperative that we understand the face? Why, why do we understand this life model that is there? Because people have gravitated toward it their their lives have been changed by it what is it hitting that we're missing well what it's hitting is that we're essentially relational beings the the number one character characteristic of god that's been passed off to us as far as the brain is concerned is it's relational it looks mm -hmm. for a connection with somebody else 
with the intention that we would share life with them. And when we do it wrong, we're death giving to others. And when we do it right, we're life giving to others. And it's the difference between wisdom and folly. All of those things come back to um, how am I relating to you? And, and so the part of the brain that creates our identity and character and responses is all the relational circuits in the brain. Uh, then we have the linguistic and, and analytical part of the brain. And the, and the problem with that is it's way downstream of all the things that give us our character. So by the time you put beliefs and understanding in there, uh, truths, which are very useful to have, by the way, but they don't really change our character very readily or very easily. It's a, it's a very, very slow process of uh, because traffic in the brain is one way, one directional traffic. So uh, with, if you put on the other hand, oh, well, let's put it this way. We're much more changed by who we love than what we believe. And so we're trying to move the Christianity back to where it was about a thousand years ago, which was primarily about our loves. Uh, and so the love of God was more central than our understanding theologically of what he was like. Is he totally other? Is he not? We don't know. We love the God, God as we look for him in our daily lives and, and we practice that with others you mentioned that's you're moving it back to a thousand years ago it, what yes we've gone through the industrial revolution and all these different things what has the church then lost that we are trying to recover and do you see it being lost globally or is it something that's more of a western phenomenon that has then a trick that that has kind of jump the the seas if you will because of the influence of the the western church on the world that it's starting to trickle into those other churches i think there's quite a difference globally to begin with although uh the same kind of problems we're having are spreading around the globe at, a, at an amazing rate so uh, that said uh, the the biggest problems in the in the western church happened with four great ideas that sort of ruined the church so in the Enlightenment, uh, we start with, um, I think, therefore I am. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that raised thinking to the most important thing about humans. And what they meant by thinking was uh, conscious, logical sort of thoughts. And so the church thought, well, you know, if you want to think and you want logical thoughts, you want truth, uh, we've got truth. So we then started making truth available to culture. Uh, the only problem is that at that point, truth began to eclipse love as the um, as the, as our central message. Uh, we began mm -hmm. arguing about truth, and then the voluntarists came along and he said, "Well, it doesn't matter what you believe if you can't make a choice." So, making the right choice became the sort of the central thing for the gospel, and so we made becoming a Christian a choosing Jesus as your savior and the solution to all problems. We're making better choices. You hear that all around the church in the West. Don't hear that much in the Eastern church or a mm. lot of other cultures, but we, you know, and, and of course we want to make good choices, but that doesn't make as big a difference as who we love. And after that, then came the will to power. What's the point in having, uh, you know, having a will and making choices if you don't have the power to have it and so Nietzsche and all the power people came along and the Nazis and other people that wanted to implement that power so and Christianity they went to power as well you know we're going to have powerful experience you know you don't have a Christianity without power so we began looking for whatever was a powerful thing and so the most common th comment I hear about worship is, wow, that was powerful because that's, you know, the value we picked up. And of course, we don't want to have inert Christianity, right? But power is not as important as who you love. And then when the truth and the right choices and the power of the spirit, all of those were failing to do things like prevent divorces and the rest of that, the church then went with culture in the direction of, well, if you're going to be loving, what you, that means is you're just going to be tolerant of everybody. And so at this junction in culture, uh, we have people being tolerant and, and defining love as being just accepting of everybody else. Um, and, you know, because there's really nothing you can do about the problems of the world anyway. Now, in the rest of the world, I think the operant condition is 
that they're surrounded by enemies of Christianity. Uh, when you're surrounded by enemies of Christianity, the only thing that really digs in and helps you is if you can spontaneously love your enemies. And that practice, you, well, you know the truth. Every, everyone can tell you you should love your enemies. That the, knowing the truth hasn't made anyone that I know of love them. Uh, trying to uh, make better choices, like I'm just going to love them, you know, doesn't do it. I mean, all these things don't work um, as a formula, because the only thing that makes us love our enemies is when we love God and we see his love for our, our enemies as well. We share that love and go like, well, yeah, God loved me when I needed help. Uh, how can I not love the people that he loves? And so that shared love, which is part of non-Western cultures uh, in communities very often, it just makes sense to them. This is what we do. And, and if you're living that life of loving the people that God loves, uh, even before they love you back, you know, while they're still enemies. Uh, and I think God was that way before, while we were still his enemies, he loved us. That is the thing that, that transforms people because they understand, you know, in the relational context already, you know, if you become, uh, if I love you, you will become one of my people. And especially if, I remember growing up in South America, as soon as someone became a Christian, uh, the, they were part of the group trying to kill us. Mm. And they had to be taken into our group immediately and become one of our people if they were going to survive, because now their people were trying to kill them. And so this sense that, you know, if we make this change of kingdoms, um, we must enter into relationship and share life together is really very prominent in the areas where Christianity uh, is much more transforming than it is in the West. There's so many different things to unpack there. You, you, you mentioned in the book about the difference between an accountability group and an identity group. And when we've talked a lot about identity, we're talking about group identity. In the West, we're very, we, of course, it's very individualistic. We're not a collective society, but we are we are all looking for our identity in something. And that's the, the, the flavor of the, the time. Everyone's searching for our identity, the rise of transgenderism. Everyone is searching for that identity. What though is the difference is where if we, we bring it back just for this, uh, a moment to the, the small group idea, what is the difference between an identity group? Why is that so important rather than like an accountability group? That's an excellent uh, distinction. Let me throw out two little things first, and then I'll get back to that, that particular question. The first is the brain is configured in such a way as it cannot see its own identity. So the foolish thing about Western culture is you just leave people to discover who they really are. You're talking about using your brain to see something it can't see. The brain is configured in such a way that we see our identity by how other people look at us. Mm. So the only question then is, are they seeing us correctly or are they seeing us distortedly? And, uh, you know, the world of flesh and the devil are all ways that see a distorted view of who we are. But if that's all our brain knows, it becomes us. And so that's you know, the first problem, we're going out looking for our identity using a method that's guaranteed not to work. Mm. It'll just lead to confused people, confused about all, everything about their identity. What's my gender? What's my uh, sexuality? What's my, um, uh, what are my people? What are my groups? What are my, all those things, you know, you just left that all up to chance now. Uh, then at age 14, your brain goes through an apoptotic period, which means it's programmed cell death. Uh, it kills off a bunch of itself mm. in order to make my individual identity less important than my group identity, which is where we have all the peer groups and everything that develop around age 14. Suddenly, my people and their survival becomes more important to your brain than your own. Now it's very important to say, well, who are my people? And so since the number one thing that comes out of um, an accountability group is I'm keeping an eye on you and how well you're doing. You know, the focus is on you and your, your choices and all that sort of thing. So uh, I'm sort of patrolling uh, your, your behavior, but an identity group says, 
we're going to teach you how to be the kind of people we want to be. And it really works with the strongest system in the brain from 14 on. It's like, who are my people and how do I become like them? What do they see in me that has yet to grow? And that's the wonderful thing about who God's created us to be. Most of what he has in mind hasn't had a chance to grow because no one's seen it. Mm. And so an identity group can say to you, once you were a thief, but now you can work with your hands uh, and give something and have something to give to others, which Paul tells his congregations, you know, you came from all these things. That's what you were before. Yeah. That's not who you really are intended to be. 100, 200 years from now, you won't be that. We see that and we'll help you to grow. And so an identity group puts into words the things that you would have never imagined were true about you and uh, which accountability can't do. So that's why the, the identity then becomes infinitely more important because accountability fails, really, because it's more about rule keeping than anything else rather than the understanding of who one is. Mm -hmm. And it runs on that things that if I could just make the right choices and make myself do it, it's, you know, which is not the thing that changes our, our uh, character. You know, it's again, we're going back to our identity is formed by the people we love. And that would be what an identity group would be. People who love each other and bring out what Christ is trying to grow in one another. So, so this is fascinating to me because we've talked a lot on here about honor, shame cultures. Of the, we have um, innocence, guilt, honor, shame, fear, power. It's all about the relational aspect, but it seems to me that there is a rise or a rediscovery of this idea of honor and shame in our, in our cancel culture. And what you seem to have drawn out is this is actually very, very biblical that, in, and you mentioned, there's a good difference between healthy shame and toxic shame. Because when I heard, I've heard some people say, oh, shame is evil. I, Biblically speaking, not not necessarily, because Paul, uh, we're hoping to have Tay Lee Lau on, and he's basically saying defending shame from Paul's perspective, because shame has a formative aspect when it's according that our we don't perform to our culture's understanding or to the true pursuit of who we are in that collective idea. Is that correct? Yeah. Several times Paul says to the Corinthians, for instance, I say this to your shame. He's intentionally producing mm -hmm. shame when they're not acting like the people God created them to be. And again, to say it real quickly for your audience, the difference between yeah. healthy shame and toxic shame is that toxic shame simply tells you what's wrong with you. Healthy shame says, here's what's wrong with you because you're not being your true self, which would be like this. And it's that encouragement to be who we were meant to be that makes shame helpful. If I just tell you, you know, you're mean and leave it there, it doesn't really tell you who you were meant to be. If I say, you know, that was kind of mean. And, and, you know, the person that God wants to grow in you is really a kind person. So let's go back and revisit that and see what Jesus can show you about being kind. That is now very healthy, Shane. Do you find that the cultures that you do this with, because you've traveled all over doing this, do they resonate with that concept or, or do they, do they, do they disagree? Well, uh, Let's just say the uh, European cultures have difficulty with it, but uh, Asian cultures uh, have, are translating this stuff as fast as they can. And I'm when sure. I go over to Asian cultures, like uh, speaking Korea or Thailand or places like that, the number one topic they want me to talk about is this honor and shame business, because in many ways, uh, you know, even in honor cultures, toxicity can build up. And so, you know, we're all looking at for ways to um, reduce the toxicity of our cultural patterns and make room for us to grow something new. And, and honor is very close to the, the center of this for Middle Eastern, Asian, African, South American um, uh, people coming out of Muslim backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's usually the Northern Europeans who are most focused on, I just have to be right. And it's harder for them to grasp. So the you know the response there is slower uh, to these honor concepts. But the the honor concepts, it, as there is a revival or a refocus on it in the West it, under different language, cancel culture, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I still see a lot of the principles at work 
with honor in a different culture. And I remember reading, it was Jason George's, he wrote a book called 3D Gospel. And in it, he he does, uh, he's a part of the Honor Shame Network, which is a, a kind of a, a course, a new uh, focus or drawing attention from a Western perspective back on something that many of the West have not been familiar with, but those who in Asian cultures are already too familiar with. But I remember him talking about shame. And, and this is a question that I've had for some time. So help me out here. Is shame something that we are, or is it something we experience? Because the way that it was communicated to uh, me was in a culture such as like India, you experience shame, you don't just experience it, you become it. And the only way that you can get out of it is if someone's in a higher social position that helps lift you out. Whereas in an honor, uh, innocence, guilt society, we, we, are, we declare our guilt and then offer uh, a confession, restitution, and then we're restored in the public eye. But in a shame culture per se, it's not necessarily like that. But from a brain science perspective and what you've seen, how does that, is that the same? Is that different? How does that work? Again, you've come up with a nice complex question. <laughs> I think it's probably crossing two things in the brain okay. that, are, that are mixed together in culture. One is status. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the other is shame. The brain is wired for se seven major emotions, six of which are unpleasant. And the one pleasant one is joy. <clears throat> so joy means I'm very glad to be with you. The opposite of joy is the shame wiring in the brain. And it's a response to when what I'm doing doesn't bring you joy. So mm. it, is, it is the sort of the alarm circuit for the joy circuit you might say. Um, now, if when I'm not bringing you joy, I have a chance to correct that, then shame does not become topic, toxic. Uh, if I don't, if once I do something that shames you, and, and uh, Brazil, for instance, is another one of place on our, our hemisphere mm -hmm. that has really a great difficulty ever recovering from shame, mm. because uh, it lowers your status. Uh, the brain is even more responsive to status cues than it is to emotional cues. So to figure out your gender, if I'm looking at you uh, using the standard formulation, uh, a binary worldview, you might say, to use mm -hmm. the current language, it takes me 150 milliseconds to figure out if you're male and female. To figure out whether your social status is higher or lower than mine takes me 40 milliseconds, about a fourth of the amount of time. So I'm very, very, very sensitive to whether something is raising or lowering my status. Now, when I go particularly to, um, I would say Buddhist and Hindu cultures, the ones that believe in reincarnation within their worldview is there's no way to improve your status. This incarnation, you can only wait till the next one. And so there's a vast amount of hopelessness built into that incar that you know reincarnation view for this particular round but status is something that if we look at Jesus during his time the highest status you could have and still be human was a demigod and a demigod had a father who was a god and a mother who was a human so along comes Jesus who has got a father who's a god and a mother who's a human He's got the highest of all status. It's basically bulletproof within his, the, the cultures of the time. You can't get higher than, than this status. And Jesus basically says, you know, because my status is bulletproof, you can't lower my status. No human being has the capacity to do so. Uh, whether you try to humiliate me or not, you can't lower my status, but I can raise yours the option of you also becoming a child of God who would have human parents and a, God, a divine parent is something he opens to other people. So the status view that you can have your status raised, but you can't raise it for yourself is very compatible with what Jesus says. And so we find he's got no worries at all about having anyone try to lower his status. And he goes to all the low status people uh, and you know, women, Jesus prostitutes, uh, tax collectors, uh, lepers, yeah. you know, and he raises their status and he says, you can have the same status that I have of being this uh, 
person with a father who's God and a mother who is human. And that that's the second birth and all these different kinds of things that we talk about. But that's a little separate, you see, but it very quickly could mix. Since oh, usually if, if I do something that brings shame on my people, they want to lower my status to, you know, you're not one of, you're, you're not a member of my people in good standing. And so I think it's the, the, these two things coming together in some of those cultures that are making it hard to sort out, you know, uh, what is shame and what is status? Status are very hard to move. Shame comes and goes very quickly uh, as an emotion response. Uh, but something that causes shame can also really, you know, take the wind out of your status. Does that make sense to you? Oh, no, it completely makes sense to me. And it actually kind of confirms something that um, we were, we were, uh, we studied a while back. Uh, we had gone through Matthew chapter six, where Jesus tells the seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And he talks about the, the birds of the air and how they, you know, and the flowers of the field. But it's interesting. Most Westerners look at it and they go, well, I have food. I've got clothing. I've got shelter. I'm all good. I'm all good. And I remember reading a book some years ago talking about poverty, but they said poverty, we in the West think of it as in terms of of goods, what one has, whereas those in other parts of the world see it more within the relationships that they have. Like I can't provide a gift for that, my child to give it a birthday party. And there's a feeling of shame with that. And I remember then looking at Matthew six, where Jesus is saying there, he mentions clothing more than he mentions anything else. And really what he's saying there is that seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And even the status that these clothing, this clothing buys will be taken care of you as well. So this relational aspect is what I'm starting to see. I mean, you bring the brain science, the cultural part to, to the fore. And that's, that's why I wanted to talk with you because as my wife started sharing the concepts at first, I was thrown off because it requires a great deal of tweaking of language. I mean, she would say, well, that's so left-brained of you. And I'm like, well, what? I, I have a full brain. <laughs> you know, why are you calling me left brain or right brain? And, and then I'd hear other women say this to the point where I'm like, I don't like anything that requires me to change my entire language of what I know what the scripture says. So I thought I'm going to investigate this myself, not necessarily as a skeptic, but you know, I, I can't put aside who I am either. I like and, a good skeptic. Well, well <laughs> um, but I, I loved it because the more that I read, and when I found out that this was done in a cross-cultural context, because we're always looking for the transcultural. I mean, at, here's what, at, at Apollos Water, we want to show people the word of God in its context, but also hold on to the mission of God as it's being worked out in the world. And we kind of see ourselves, and I've joked about this, that we're like uh, Toby Maguire's Spider-Man on the front of a train as it's getting ready to careen off of a track. And we're holding on to the word of God on one side and holding on to the mission of God, trying to keep the church in the West from going off the track. Because the church in the West has become this performance-driven entertainment show where they used they use the truth of Christ for salvation, but it's so, I don't want to say myopic, but surface level that there's not an understanding of the of the transcendent transformation that occurs. Because like you, I'm seeing a an awareness where people say these things, but then you look at the operation and how it's occurring within churches, especially within leadership that are all measuring the, the measurables, that there's not a relational understanding. Because as one man in India told me, it's one thing to pay for the elephant, it's another thing to feed it. And it becomes this institution we have to feed. And here you're calling people back to the relational aspect of true transformation that's not just cerebral, but it's holistic in its nature. And as you were coming up with this, I mean, I, I, I see the different pieces that you've written. They all build off the kind of the life model works. You even talk about the Pandora's problem, the narcissism in church. Uh, there's so many different ways to go with this honor and, and shame idea. But you said that you're seeing the Asian cultures can't translate this fast enough. What are the cultures that you do find that are most drawn to this? And I think you've already alluded to it with Korea. And then you mentioned the Western Europeans have a harder time, but what are the cultures that really have, it's taken fire in, in that culture? Is it, I mean, Korea, are you seeing this in India? And how many cultures are, is the life model works that you are aware of in? I would have to say that the, the places where they, um, 
still understand the concept of elder as a person who's uh, responsible for the the growth or identity of a community whatever culture still retains that uh, tends to absorb the life model very very quickly uh, doesn't have any bearing on their education so when mm. i talk to people with second grade educations but they you know ba barely speak a language in common with me but we begin to talk about this knowing god and loving god and seeing others and becoming part of a spiritual people so they have a sense of identity as a people you see they know what that is mm -hmm, even mm -hmm. if they're not at home with the people that that they call their own if that it remains the, the life model is absorbed very very quickly and so far we've get a pretty good uh, representation from almost um, every continent except Antarctica. We're not making progress with the penguins, but we, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the South Sea Islanders uh, respond very well. Um, Asian cultures, uh, with the exception of uh, perhaps North Korea. <laughs> North Korea has been so traumatized that the whole idea of relationship is now been um, it's it's kind of dangerous to have relationship with anybody and some of the uh, previous countries that were behind the iron curtain where relationships again became quite dangerous um, they they approach this all very cautiously like do i really want to trust anybody again uh, hmm. middle east um Refugees are responding well. Even the Europeans um, have a small contingent of people who are just saying, you know, the church, the way I've experienced it, hasn't worked for us well. And we're very good at arguing with each other, but we're still not acting like Jesus is supposed to, uh, are absorbing these things. But I'd have to say uh, how many cultures we've got in, uh, we're translated our works into only about 14 languages it, it very quickly absorbed into those more traditional cultures like africa asia south america and the south sea islanders and and asia and we're having harder the farther you go north and the more you have to be right uh the harder mm -hmm. it is for people to accept so H how about it oh, i'm sorry go ahead uh that's that's keeping us from the regions of the world that are coldest. Mm. How are people then in North America receiving it? As you said before, there's uh, a high value for truth, but not necessarily on relationship. And with the church being so divided now, uh, we had George Yancey, a sociologist out of Baylor on and wrote the book, One Faith no more, where they were looking at Christianity in red and blue America and basically concluded that between conservative Christianity and progressive Christianity, they felt that there were two different religions uh, at its core in the research that they came up with because the foundation was so different. And he said, rather than just seeing the conservatives as political, which is what we thought when we started the research, that progressives were actually much more political in their mindset. However, when I see churches today and I talk to different pastors, they say that they've never seen their own church so divided, even as people are moving across states and moving into places where their belief systems are much more supported, uh, whichever case that may be. How did, does the life model transcend that and unite people? Have you seen that at all? Or is that asking, um, is that something that you haven't even bridge yet or have you heard anything about it i know there's a lot of questions there but take a stab yeah. at any of them well the the current book that we have uh in the in the works is uh pretty well focused on the issues you just brought up the brain actually has a state which we are calling enemy mode enemy and what, mode and yes and when your brain drops into that anything you say or do will be assumed to be the point of view an enemy you're not on my side and so the goal in enemy mode is always to win um, and when you're winning you are, will not you know any damage i do to you is actually beneficial to my side if i make you look stupid it's better for me if i you know make you look um, 
um, ignorant or you know whatever it is and so whatever those conversations that take place during enemy mode um, do not actually resolve um, the alienation between people so we're actually attempting some experiments with, between african-american churches and white churches and some of the other groups that have been alienated uh, most classically to see if we can make some uh, of the basic Christ Christian processes and practices work to get people out of enemy mode by basically approaching the logic that the Bible says I should love my enemies. So as soon as you start feeling like my enemy, that is the spot where we start to work on our Christianity. You might remember earlier I said that the places in the world where people have in mind that they have to love their enemies are the places where Christianity is the most vibrant. Mm -hmm. So the very fact that we are now becoming enemies between the, these different red and blue places uh, might actually work to our advantage. We're currently testing that sort of experimentally to see if it'll work, mm -hmm. but that's kind of where our learning curve is at the moment. But going back for a second, addressing this book that you're writing, um, there was an article that came out in the Atlantic the other day, and uh, it was about a man who had gone to two different churches outside of Detroit. And he, he, and I, I, I hope that I don't get the details incorrect, but in it, he said, one of the pastors had a church of about 300 and another one had a church of about a hundred before the pandemic started. He said, but one of them was challenging his congregation because he saw the nationalism that was taking root, the, the love for conspiracy theories, the, just the, the promulgation of it everywhere or the propagation of it, just, you know, pushing it, doing all of these different things. He said at one of his gatherings with his church, he put up one of the liberal senators in Minnesota's photo. Um, I think it's, I, I don't want to get her name correct, but Senator Omar, um, who is more from a Muslim background and, and more of a, a progressive. And he was talking about Jesus loving your enemies and he gave different pictures and people said, yes. And he put her up and he said, are we supposed to love her? And it was very, very quiet. And he said, but the other pastor, this, this man who was attending both of these churches just to examine him, started off with a church of 100 that swelled to 1,500 because he was saying that the election was stolen. He, he starts, he doesn't touch the Bible, uh, goes through every different kind of conspiracy theory that there is. As we do go into enemy mode, when is enemy mode or is it ever correct? Yes, we're to love our enemies, but even Jesus says, you know, you brood of vipers, you know, tell that fox Herod. <laughs> I mean, he, how do we differentiate between loving our enemies on that one hand and then separating ourselves and calling something evil at the same time? So the thing about enemy mode, once your brain is in enemy mode, um, is that it no longer is calculating the least harmful alternative. So a, uh, mm. a chokehold versus just subduing you and taking you to the jail are kind of the same, uh, but the chokehold's faster. So the least harmful alternative doesn't get calculated. When we're dealing with uh, enemies from a biblical point of view, we still have to be thinking, what's the least harmful alternative? And it doesn't mean that we don't understand how they think, but we don't also fall into that. My win is making you lose mm. uh, perspective. Actually, our win is making them raise their status to being children of God like we are. Mm. And in fact, the more annoying they are, the probably the farther they are from who God meant them to be. And if we're trying to help them become who God meant them to be, uh, the more egregiously different they are, the more the love of God is supposed to support us and go like, yeah, there's somebody who really needs me. So uh, let's go after that as opposed to, well, there's somebody who's going, you know, we'll win if you can make them lose. And that's what enemy mode does to your brain. It's for years. We'll win if you lose, as mm. opposed to my win is helping you become who you were meant to be. So I don't think we ever want to get into enemy mode uh, uh, deliberately, but the, the actual answer is not to keep ourselves out of it because your brain goes into enemy mode very easily and well, just slides right into it. Um, 
sort of like the difference between going down a hill on a toboggan and having to walk it back up the hill again. Getting out of enemy mode is much harder. And to do that, we have to connect with the mind of Christ. Okay, so this is someone who doesn't wish me well. You know, how does your kingdom see this? What is our kingdom strategy? And one of the things that we don't want any of our enemies to do, which gets back to the other part, is to mistake uh, what they're doing is what God wants. Right. Right. So if we allow them to be deluded and think, oh, that God's going to love what you're doing now, um, yeah, you know, we would have to still denounce uh, something. But then we have to add to that, you know, and that's not who God means you to be. And let me help you become the person God wants you to be. If we don't add that to it, now we've just stayed enemies. It's much easier to describe than it is to do, I might add. Mm. Well, you also talk about this in this, this rare leadership. And I, I want to transition uh, a little bit because rare is an acronym and it stands for return to joy. And then uh, I, I'm making sure that I acting as yourself. And then I got to think here. Uh, and then remain relational is the remain first relational one. that's it remain relational uh, acting like yourself return to joy and then endure hardship well mm -hmm. right in this yeah. rare leadership describe that for a moment those four points in the the rare leadership and what that is well first of all that acronym is something that dr uh, marcus warner came up with and i do so poorly with acronyms that before this call i went and looked it up <laughs> so i <could> <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's great. You're being your authentic self. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so that's how I happen to know. And uh, <laughs> so, so good. Yeah. So the, here, here's the remaining. First of all, and one way to summarize the whole thing is how to stay yourself under pressure. Hmm. Uh, and to say yourself, you have, we're talking about the person God means you to be. In some cases, we haven't really even developed that very well. But mm -hmm. remaining relational is the first characteristic. We want to stay connected with God. So what he says to us is important. And when we're staying connected to God, so what he says to us is important. By the way, if you switch off the relational part of your brain, you hear what God is saying, but it doesn't strike you as important. It strikes you maybe as annoying. Mm. Uh, you know, I've had a number of people say something like, you know, you can take that Bible verse and do something with it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've all had that, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the the message that would have touched their heart didn't because their brain was in a non-relational state. They took that as an enemy attack to make mm -hmm. them feel bad or something. So remaining relational is that connection with God. Uh, and people always say, well, do I want to stay relational with somebody that, you know, I don't like? And my answer to that is, at what point would you rather be handling your problems by yourself without having God to help you? Mm. And really, the answer to that, if you think about it a little bit, is like, I don't think I ever want to be in that state. Mm -hmm. So rela remaining relational does not mean that the person we're dealing with is relational. It means that our mind is still uh, running correctly. And really your brain sort of sees the blue screen of death. If you've had one of those computers that just kind of goes, Bleep. you know, we're yeah. not computing right now. When we drop out of relational mode, your brain starts processing things in all kinds of screwy way or stops entirely. So that's the first part. Uh, then acting like yourself. Remember, we can't see who we really are. Right. So we're sort of part of a group who's discovering whose God is creating us to be. And we're encouraging that process. And whenever I forget who I am, myself, the scriptures, God, or uh, the people around me remind me who I was meant to be. There's one really, I think it's sort of a lame movie. I don't see very many, but it's called Mr. Holland's Opus. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was but, lame? Oh, now I feel well, shame. Ah, oh, dear. <laughs> I've created a problem here. I don't think it was one of the best movies ever made, let's just say. Yeah. But the theme was every time he would um, reach a, some kind of limitation in himself, the people around him would say, you could do better than that. We want more from you. You have a, There's more to you as a teacher, there's more to you as a father, there's more to you as a husband, more to you as all these other things. Um, so don't, don't let your first reaction 
you know, you're not such a good expression of yourself stand, we're going to look for something better. And that's really what acting like yourself is encouraging other people to, you know, when they louse it up, to go, um, let's go back and try that again. Uh, we need to practice being your, your good self, which means the third point, returning to joy. Joy in this case, not being uh, just being euphoric, but being glad to be with other people. So mm. one of the things that most of us experience is when we finally get around to saying, I'm sorry I said that, the people who we've offended are more glad to be with us than they were before. It's like, oh, maybe we'll start this relationship again. Maybe we'll, so returning joy is that path of saying, you know, if our relationship has been broken, which is basically what isn't happening between the extreme groups and Christianity you just mentioned, we're not trying to find our way back to being glad to be together. We're trying to find our way to win and be right, which is a different pathway. So returning to joy says, you know, I want to, I want to find you and help you find who God meant you to be, and we're going to help that grow. And then if you do that under duress, then you're enduring hardships well. When people are upset with you, when they're afraid of you, when they look at you and go, oh, you're one of them, do you remember who you are and say, well, yes, but we're part of the people of God. And as um, Peter says, once you are not a people, once you had not received mercy, but now you have re received mercy so you can become part of the people of God. So are we welcoming people who are not once our people by extending that kind of mercy and saying, uh, yeah, uh, even though we have hurt each other, um, I want to welcome you back in as we return or become finally the people of God. And that, that's sort of the summary of the book. It's written for leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's simply because leaders are the ones that are finding it hardest to uh, figure mm -hmm. out how do I stay myself because uh, I'm most leaders are getting killed by leadership. It becomes performance standards, and if you're not getting right. great results, uh, then you know the, my my status drops. And uh, so, how do I actually avoid this terrible, stressful? burning out kind of experience and it says no we have to become the people we're meant to be and funny thing as leaders is we have to teach that to others even while we're learning it ourselves otherwise our, our the people our congregants will not allow us to be ourselves they want performance that's what their culture has told them to be but pastors have to teach people to be something they never were before right and, and so this is we're guiding the process to where we need to be as well I was talking with uh, Dr. Robert White, who had been on the show before. He's with, a counselor with Care for Pastors in Leesburg, uh, Florida, and they they work with basically kind of a, a, a pastoral triage, if you will, pastors that are that are coming out. And he said, you know, we used to get so many calls a month. Now we're getting, you know, four or five a day. Mm -hmm. Just so many pastors are are burning out. And I think what you're what what I see, and I think what your book is articulating, is that there's been such a performance addiction. And people are trying to keep the institution and they are to perform, but their soul has been lost because there's not been proper soul care. There's not been a, a proper understanding of relationships. There's been a lot of mistrust and a lot of schools have not really developed that. Although I'm seeing seminaries and Bible colleges beginning to help train um, going, going forward. But see, seeing that and you seeing where the church is at right now, and it's at a very very difficult place. What what do you see as the biggest trouble that out of all of the things that are affecting the church or afflicting the church in the West, let's say, in the West, what is the the, the biggest thing that you see and you hope to be able to address or, or that how God would use your work to address it to help act as a corrective in, in some way? And, and I'm very aware that there are several factors that play in that. And there's not probably not one that we can just simply isolate. Maybe there is, and it has many different solutions as there are many different problems. But knowing still the complexity of it, if you were to simplify it in your own mind, how do you, what do you think that is? And what do you hope your, how, how God would use your work to help make that a, a, a correction? Well, the, the first thing to just clarify is that the life model works is, should be considered something like a dietary supplement. 
It is not a replacement for the whole gospel. It's not a replacement for theology. It's not a replacement for church polity. And one of the reasons it's been so widely accepted by different groups uh, that would otherwise not get along is that we are not actually coming in from the view of trying to modify anyone's theology mm. about the basics, things of Christianity. And we're actually not particularly trying to teach that either. Not because it's unimportant, but because the church has worked for centuries mm. getting down what they believe and tweaking that a little bit here or there is not really the issue. The problem we're getting is that when it comes to teaching human brains how to act like Jesus, everybody's getting uniformly less encouraging results than they want. So uh, the Coptic church, they're interested in what we're doing because they want to take better care of orphans. The Eastern Orthodox is interested in something, the Salvation Army wants something, Pentecostal groups want something else, but all of them come back to the same thing. We're not actually experiencing uh, the kind of character that we want to see to the extent we want it. And so we have three elements we add to whatever you're doing. So, you know, one of the things people said, well, shouldn't you have life model churches? And I said, no, absolutely not. I never want to see a life model church. That isn't, that isn't enough to be a church. Mm. but I would like to see a life model things added to you to your churches and the three elements that we've identified one is a multi-generational community and mm. to really sustain joy you have to have at least three but optimally four generations working together and the church since the industrial revolution has really taken out each peer group and, and separated them and a lot of churches have only one generation within them uh, or maybe one and a half, you know, but they're like, everybody is the same age. No one knows more than any, anyone else. Now, peer groups are very, very help, helpful for practice. So we don't eliminate those, but multi-generational communities make a big difference to whether or not you are actually transferring the kind of relationships and character and identity that uh, are transformative. Second thing is an Emmanuel lifestyle. <clears throat> which means we we live looking for the active presence of Jesus. Mm. So if you had a church, the multi-generational, you will raise nice human beings like all other nice human beings. Unless God shows up and says you're more than those human beings could ever imagine in ways that are unique to you and to your group, you don't turn out people that look like Jesus. And so this awareness of what God is saying to us and how he's guiding us on a moment-by-moment -moment basis is the second element of this, um, you know, um, church environment that we're looking for. It's actually a community environment because we want it to go outside the church. And then the third one is there's relational brain skills, just like you would have a literacy program to teach people how to read the Bible. There's some specific things your brain has to be able to do and so we want to help people identify what those are and which ones are missing uh, and help you then to teach other people those specific brain skills that trauma and other kinds of evil in the world keep eliminated from the fabric of the multi-generational community. Uh, and one of those skills that particularly Christian is being able to uh, identify God's thoughts as separate from all the other thoughts that run through our head. How do we recognize his voice? And, you know, this is something we have to learn. Every generation has to learn it. And it's just one of the things. But those three things are, are the unique features that we bring. And they seem to apply to every, every place, every Christian group and culture uh, around the world from all different perspectives. Um, they said, yeah, we could use more multi-generational community. We could use more awareness of God's active presence. And yeah, I'm not sure about that last one, <laughs> the brain skills, but, uh, you know, give them a few examples. Here, here's a simple one. Now, anger is one of the alarm circuits in the brain. It's meant to use to bring our relationships uh, to improve them. I said, so how many people do you know who, feel anger and go, wow, I'm about to have a better relationship with this person. I'm going to improve it. Or they see someone else who's angry. And almost everywhere around the world, when people see anger, they go like, uh-oh, uh, 
you know, nothing good can come of this. Uh, whereas if you understand uh, what anger is there for, it's a very good useful thing to improve your relationships. So the people who learn how to do that uh, are not causing danger or damage to others when they get angry. And it's very easy, you know, to find out who doesn't do that because they'll say to others, well, don't get me mad because you won't like it. That's a good indication. You haven't learned how to use um, anger helpfully. And again, for most people, when I say that, it's like, I hear your words. I see your lips moving. And I have no idea what you're talking about because our, our brain has got a gap right there. Like I've never seen what you're talking about. So it makes no sense to me any more than let's say, uh, you know, trying to read Arabic. Mm -hmm. It's like, I see marks, but I don't see any meaning. <laughs> I don't see the words. Uh huh. Yeah. The words. You, you mentioned, I, I just find this fascinating because you mentioned anger and I remember doing a sermon on anger and we said, you know, anger is not always a bad thing. Because I've met people, they say anger is always a bad thing. And I said, really, it's sometimes it's it's a response to a perceived injustice. Or if it is a real injustice, then if I do see a child being beaten or, or someone kicked, I, I want to respond. But you has, you said in a healthy way. And what does mm -hmm. that look like? But I, I want to go back again for what you said here, just to, to, to kind of support. Um, you mentioned the multi-generational thing. And I remember that in church planning in the 1970s was the theory that if you plant with one specific group and age group, that the churches would grow that homogeneous unit principle, which now I think people are saying, no, we need multi-generations because we need to speak in. And then uh, we read Souls in Transition, uh, researched by Christian Smith out of Notre Dame. And I uh, hope to have him on the guest on the show, but they had researched and found the. they did a study on, uh, it was a religious study on American youth, the largest that had ever been done in history. And they came to the conclusion after several years, kids that had been raised in the faith that stayed in the faith, they said, came down to three things. One was that the parents lived out or modeled what you're talking about, uh, modeled in the home, what was being taught at other times. Two, mm -hmm. another adult outside of the family supported, again, the multi-generational idea. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you guys extrapolate community. on that. Yeah, that community. But they said third, and I thought this one was very interesting, they suffered for their faith. There, there was this idea of suffering and the suffering well. So I'm seeing mm -hmm. these, these, these uh, pieces starting to connect. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do is connect the lines and for, for people, which you guys have really done in an impressive way, looking at the, the culture, looking at brain science, crossing these into experiencing God. Because I, I hear other people say, I'm tired of going through the motions in church. And I, and I hear people talking about the management, about the show, but you cannot manufacture joy you, you can't manufacture it. It has to be a true relational understanding. And that's hard to do when there's a performance aspect. And you guys have seemed to really to, to draw that out. Uh, yeah, even from the brain perspective, uh, there's two different smile centers in the brain. One has got voluntary sort of smile for the camera. Yeah. And yeah. the other is the joy smile. And 97% of people cannot intentionally produce a joy smile. The three percent that can do it by remembering a joyful thing. And uh, they're in so, Hollywood. They're in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're in Hollywood. Now, one other question I have here is uh, in, uh, my 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 daughter has this question. Being a college student, she said, "Do you have any advice for college students bringing these concepts into their dorms? Have you ever seen any success like this thus far in that environment?" Um. Yeah, that really the area that we're most interested in, you know, evil propagates on its own without any additional help. So you, mm. you, you hurt somebody and they'll very easily go and hurt somebody else. Uh, we believe that truth and, and goodness and God's presence should propagate on its own too. It should be something that spreads sort of infectiously when, when you have it. Um, and so uh, you know, you mentioned the rare leadership book. We wrote mm -hmm. a secular version of a rare leadership in the workplace and say, hey, we'll show you how to be joyful people who have a, are building a group identity. And this is what we're going to do in our workplace. And it's been very interesting for me to watch that book, that particular application take off faster mm. than uh, the Christian book has even. So uh, you know, major, one of the top three software 
places in the in the United States, you know, uh, they wanted their sales team to study it. Uh, the mm. Christian Association of Dentists wanted to use that in their workplace. It's the idea of, you know, this is the kind of people we all wish we had as a boss, as a fellow employee of someone like that. So if Christians have something joyful, they will spread that to the people around them. So the, the, the sort of the contagious nub mm -hmm. in, involves, I'd say, sort of three elements. One is uh, you're joyful. Secondly, when you pass something to other people, you do so peacefully. So Passing the Peace has been one of the books that we read. So if what I have to tell you comes out agitated, upset, uh, uh, you're not going to want to hear it. Mm. But if I'm experiencing God's peace when I tell you something, uh, all of a sudden you wonder, how are you peaceful about that? What about you gives that calm, that lack of worry, that lack of whatever else? You're glad to be with me. There's a joy. But the message you bring me is one of peace. And even Jesus said, when we go into a town, you look for the man of peace, right? We're looking mm -hmm. for the people who will accept peace. Uh, they're not Christians yet, uh, they're, but they're interested in, in someone approaching them with peace. And so that's the second element. The third element is, if we go back to the upper room discourse with Jesus, he says mm -hmm. to his disciples, from now on, the world will not see me, but the people who are attached to me will see me. And uh, Judas, not Iscariot, is a you know, just surprised. How do you mean they're not going to see you? And Jesus said, like, no, to see me, you have to have an attachment with me, a love for me in your heart. And then when Jesus says, you'll go into the world and be my witnesses, I believe he's talking about, you'll be the one who goes there and sees that I'm there. Hmm. Not someone who'll go out and be able to explain, you know, all of the intricate theology of the Bible. It's like, you can see I'm present. And when you bring that news to other people, like, you know, Jesus is here and he likes you and here's what he likes about you. And here's what he wants to grow in you. This is very irresistible mm. for anybody who is open to God at all. It'll also bring attacks from some other people, uh, but that's the nature of the kingdom, right? It offends the ones who are just determined uh, that they want to promote evil. But mm. I think if, if you look at those simple things, I'm, I'm here, I'm glad to be with you. I share with you my peace, and I see in the moment what Jesus is seeing here. And it takes some practice to learn to do that. Uh, that, I think, spreads very nicely to um, any dorm, any college. Um, and obviously also, you know, seeing what Jesus sees involves a prayer life that is listening to him. But this is what we're trying to learn to do. Um, and then finally, because there are going to be people who will put you into enemy mode, we need to have a few people on our side who say, yeah, I'm going to be with you while you're in enemy mode. And we're going to, we're, you know, when I get into enemy mode, it's like my internet goes off. Mm -hmm. So I no longer hear God very clearly because I'm mad. I'm, yeah. So I need to be with some people whose uh, Wi-Fi I can borrow. So, mm. oh, you're connected with God still. You're not upset about this. You can hear what he's, and you can bring me back into connection with him. That kind of group fellowship uh, will pull us back from the people that are driving us crazy. Uh, so those are the elements I'd suggest uh, for your daughter. And, you know, uh, mm. if, it, if anything in there resonates with her, it's probably God's spirit at work. You mentioned having that person outside that can speak to us when we're in enemy mode and immediately mm -hmm. flashed in my, my head, Balaam and his donkey. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. he, he was in enemy mm -hmm. mode. And the only thing he could hear from was the donkey. <laughs> yeah. God will pick some strange. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there is so much of what you're doing and I'm sure a lot of people have a lot of questions because I know that I have, and I, and I feel like I've only started exploring the life model works and all of the different pieces. And that's after hearing it over the past year and a half, almost two years. Um, how do people get connected and learn more about life model works and a lot of the things that you are doing? Well, the best place to probably to chase that down is the lifemodelworks.org, that one website where we try to 
keep whatever we're developing uh, present. We also work with some partner ministries, one of which is called Thrive Today, where the brain skills are taught. So if you want to keep track of that, that would be a, another place you could go and uh, check in on it. I'm told there's also, if you look me up on the YouTube or other kind of internet stuff, there's you know, a bunch of teachings out there. I've never gone to look, but um, you know, there's, it's kind of fun that social media is sharing some of that. So, uh, mm. but the main thing I would say is if you want to keep track of where we're developing um, and the thing with internet and websites is that it's constantly being redone because it didn't work the last time quite the way we <laughs> wanted it to. So I'll, I'll just say, you know, like it's, it's our best shot at it so far. We hope it'll be better next time. <laughs> it helps us to return to joy. <laughs> uh, yeah. Stay humble too. Um, one of the last things I wanted to ask, and I know that someone had impressed this upon me because they do follow a lot of the ministry and they've been greatly impacted in the resources that you have created. And they said, I, I do have one question for him. How, how can we best pray for him and what God is doing through him? Well, um, here's the thing. About 40 years ago, I decided if I was going to start uh, figuring out some of these things about how the brain works and how, you know, why some people are getting transformation from their Christian lives and others aren't, that I was going to have to give up all of the social media and magazines and watching TV. And so I've seen um, very few movies and TV shows or anything else uh, for the last 40 years. What well, that's made possible for me to do is to read some books and study some things and come up with some new perspectives, but it's also made it equally hard for me to communicate with culture. Mm. So you're right on that interface. You're, you're doing the very sort of thing that I would ask people to pray for, you know, uh, the book, the other half of church written with Michael Hendricks, whose claim to fame is he can actually make me sort of understandable to other people. <laughs> <laughs> He's coming on the show, by the way. Oh, well, I'm very glad to hear that. They'll, yeah. they'll finally know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we, we need the people who say uh, we can make this understandable for culture. And I think primarily the ones that we need are artists and musicians. The identity center in the brain will listen to songs about our identity will not listen to words. So if we could sing more to each other about how to return to joy and how to see what Jesus is seeing and uh, put it in art and, and express things that in those ways that communicate to large numbers of people, the joy of God. I mean, what would happen if we just became the people who are going to make the world understand the joy is relational. It's not just a, some kind of a happy pill that you take. Um, what would that do to the understanding of who Christians are? And, and so praying that interface, you know, how does this get into the world? Um, you know, God has got something in mind and, uh, you yeah, know, pray for it. One question I have this, because you just mentioned this and I, I forgot to ask it, but how do we sing to one another? Like I understand singing to God, I don't know how much I understand singing to one another. What do you mean by that? Well, it's odd that the church goes through these phases. At one point, it's like we're pray we will only sing praise music to God. Yeah. Uh, another point, we just pray. We sing theology, so we've got all these theological statements. Uh, another phase, we pray, uh, sing psalms, you know, if it's not in scripture, we won't sing it. But the church is also going through a phase where we sing to each other, like, uh, brother, let me be your servant. Let me be like Christ to you. Pray that I might have the grace to let you be my servant too. Uh, that's one of the songs out of the seventies, for instance. And so we're singing to each other about who we are, you know, why we care about things. Uh, there used to be God be with you till we meet again. That was another mm. song. You know, it's like our relationship will endure even after you leave. And so there's these things that we could sing to each other. You know, I know you're mad at your wife today, but, uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, 
we're here for you. And, and you know, what would we sing to people? Wouldn't it be interesting? A lot of people go to church mad at their wives, you know, or husbands or whatever it is. Um, there's, I love you with the love of the Lord. Um, there's these songs that keep showing up, but we haven't really developed them in a way that help us with our six negative emotions. So what happens if I get to church and I'm just disgusted or I'm feeling shame or I'm, you know, and there, you actually, if you look at the Psalms, a lot of them do have that content in there. Mm. That's so, what I uh, love about the, the yeah. word of God. I love mm -hmm. that. Uh, I, I, I remember my wife saying that, and I remember reading that in the book and I went, say what? I didn't think of it that way. I, I was thinking of, of course, the reaction is, is be vertical and in, in singing. I, I, I do believe in singing. I'm a trained singer and that's how I met my wife. So nice. singing is very, very powerful. And even singing after reading about how singing, what it does to our brain, I, Tim Tennant, the president of Asbury did a thing with his wife where they took all of the Psalms and they put it to simple hymn melodies and you can choose which one they have mm -hmm. a, a website um, seed faith, I think is what it's called. And you go there and you can pick a Psalm and then it gives you three or four different melodies in that same meter that mm -hmm. you could sing like the, the same uh, music from amazing grace or the love of God. And you can put different words to it from that Psalm. And so I thought mm -hmm. that's, 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 these are wonderful things that I think we have lost that we need to do and rediscover rather than just have performers on the stage, but we're to be participants and to be mm -hmm. engaged in that regard. So just a hearty yeah. amen to everything you just said. Hearty amen. Yeah. One real quick example, you know, that, no. um, you know, a lot of churches actually uh, traditionally have sung the scriptures, uh, through cantors, the Jewish uh, tradition, mm -hmm. the Eastern Orthodox tradition, um, and even the Muslim tradition have, they've got a to tonal quality mm -hmm. to everything they do. We might not consider it music, but when my brother and I used to fight as little kids, my mother used to start singing inside the house, be ye kind to one another, be ye kind to everyone. And my brother and I'd look at each other and sort of disgust, like oh, she's <laughs> singing that song yet. But <laughs> we, we, we would always stop fighting and look at each other like, I have to be kind to you. <laughs> oh. and, a, and a few years later uh, at the counseling center where I was, um, they gave me the job of firing all the people who weren't doing well at work. Um, and I asked him why he said, well, you know, it's strange about you, but even when you're firing people, you're kind about it. And so we put you in charge of that job. And it, what took me back to that song that no matter how unpleasant the interaction, there ought to be a kind way to do it. And I think that was sung into me by my mother at a very early age. You could probably use more of that. <laughs> we, well, I've done, I've not done anything quite like that, but I remember I've tried to do the same thing and be kind and I was getting, getting a, t a speeding ticket and I thanked the officer and my friends were like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. well, he's doing his job. He's got mm -hmm. a job to do. It's keeping us safe. I'm not happy, but at the same time, I can't fault the guy for doing his job. I, mm -hmm. I need to, to thank him for that. But that's funny. Be kind. Are there any other songs that your mother sang that were getting you? Because I'm going to uh, use them for my kids. Uh, not, <laughs> I, I hate to say it, but that's the only one that I recall. It may, okay. have, been, may have been the only one right there. So. <laughs> but I remember uh, just last week I was flying. I Thank the TSA agent who went through my suitcase. And I remember her look at me like, what kind of a weirdo are you thinking? So I relate to your story a little there. <laughs> well, that's good. That's practicing gratitude and appreciation. There and, you go. And, and those are those, those practices that you that you, you wrote about. And uh, I think that many of us can do, uh, do a lot more with, but Jim, I want to thank you for coming on Apollos water. Just thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for what you're doing. And I pray that God would continue to bless your, your ministry and impact people the world over. Well, thank you, Travis. I really appreciate being part of uh, Christianity. That's looking beyond our, your, our cultural interpretation of what it meant to be Christian. Uh, because you know, I think something about Christianity, it transforms all cultures. Yes. Uh, and so when we can separate out those elements, uh, we're in for some uh, 
some really good growth. And so thank you for being a part of that and for having me on your program. It's a joy. Thank you.